to you all today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Audrey Lucero, associate professor of education studies and director of critical and sociocultural studies in education at the University of Oregon. Lucero's work investigates the oral language development of young Spanish English bilingual children. At UO, Lucero is an active member of the Latinx Strategies Group, the Dreamers Working Group Steering Committee, and the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies. She also directs the newly launched Latinx Studies Minor. Thanks, Audrey, for coming on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So tell us first about your journey to becoming a professor of education studies. What led to your interest in education and language? Well, I actually started, like many of our students in the Department of Education Studies, as a teacher myself. So I, um, to be honest, I started teaching so that I could travel because it was a way that I could teach English abroad. Um, and so I did that for a few years and I became really interested in teaching actually. So I went and got my master's degree in K-12 education and taught first grade for a few years. I realized that teaching five and six year olds wasn't my forte, but I became very interested in the process of learning to read and write among five and six year olds. And in particular, I worked in a very diverse school in Seattle where a majority of my students were um, English as a second language speakers. And so I became really interested in their process of learning two languages simultaneously and learning to read and write in a language that wasn't used in their home. So, um, because I saw the struggles that these kids faced. So I went on to get a PhD in language and literacy education at uh, the University of Washington. And while I was there, I really became interested in conducting research to understand better the experiences that these children have as they move through school. Um, so that's why I ended up here. I've been here for 10 years and I work with a couple of the dual language immersion schools in Eugene because that's a particular area of interest for me, uh, how those languages support the continued bilingual development of these kids. Um, so that's how I got here. Would you tell us a little bit more about one of the specific research projects that you're working on? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, COVID has thrown things a bit out of whack, but one of the projects that I'm currently developing is a project called Languaging While Comprehending. And I think about languaging as a, as a verb, as an action, rather than language as a stationary object. Right, that's, that's sort of the way that we're thinking about language and education now. And so I'm really interested in the dynamic language practices that bilingual children undertake, particularly when they're engaging with books, because I'm a language and literacy scholar. So um, the project that I'm currently working on is with fourth and fifth grade dual language immersion students who speak Spanish at home as they engage with wordless picture books. So uh, the idea is, and the, the picture books that we're using are related to migration, and in particular migration across the southern border. Um, so using a picture book called Pancho Rabbit and the Coyote, and of course the Coyote is a dual meaning, right? In the picture book it's an animal, it's sort of a fable, but it also is someone who's hired to smuggle people across the border. So migration is an experience that's familiar to many of these students, if not themselves, then their families, their communities are having these conversations. And so we're really interested, I have two doctoral students working with me in how children use language sort of flexibly and dynamically, their two languages to process the, what's happening in the picture books, right? So we sort of prompt them to look at the pictures, to engage in discussion with us and to think about how they might write this story before we actually read the words with them. Because I'm really interested in their making sense of text through discussion, through engagement with illustrations, and then you know, putting the author's words on top of that. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm working with right now. I think you know, a lot of the literature around language in particular says that language and identity are, are closely tied. So giving these students the opportunity to use their languages flexibly enables them to sort of build their identities as bilingual members of a community. And that's really my goal is to help support and facilitate that bilingualism. 
So you've you you've already started to get at my next question, but say a little bit more about these dual language programs and dual language learning and how it impacts larger questions of learning just in general. Yeah, the idea behind dual language immersion education is that um, supporting the continued development of children's home languages is supportive not only of their identity development, but also supportive of their academic development in both languages, actually. So there's some research that shows that children who go through these dual language immersion programs, and that's where they receive, incidentally, um, instruction, content instruction in both languages. The vast majority of such programs are Spanish English, but they exist in many languages around the country. Um, and that children have the opportunity to learn content in their home language facilitates their learning. It also facilitates their academic achievements um, and their English development, because we know that languages are um, commonly, so common underlying proficiency is this theory that says that languages aren't separate in our brains. Um, and if you spend any time with proficient bilinguals, you'll hear us translanguaging all the time, right? Going back and forth between the two languages in terms of which makes the most sense to use in a particular situation. So the opportunity for kids to be in these programs enables them to use both of their languages to facilitate their learning and to facilitate their achievement. Um, so that's the idea is that they really arose out of equity movements in the 60s and 70s. And um, they've, they've spread pretty widely beyond that to the point where now one of the tensions and this exists in Eugene is who has access to these programs. Um, is it the children for whom they were designed, the language minority Spanish speakers, or is it the white English speaking families who are moving into the communities for these programs? And this is what happened at the school I used to teach at in Seattle, actually. It, um, they had a, a strand in Spanish and a strand in Mandarin, and it became highly sought after. And as that community began to gentrify because it was close to downtown and um, parents got pushed out, lower income families got pushed out, it became more of an additive you know, support for affluent families than it did um, a needed support for native uh, Chinese and Spanish speaking children. So that's one of the serious tensions in dual language education right now is who has access and whose needs are prioritized. You, you mentioned that this is something that's relevant in the Eugene School District. We, we tell us a little bit about, I mean, you just described what happened in mm -hmm. Seattle. Will you say a little bit about what's happening here? Yeah, sure. So um, the idea with, uh, and the school that I've worked most closely with is El Camino del Rio, uh, River Road, and um, they're I, the, the goal is to have 50% Spanish speakers and 50% English speakers, home speakers in each grade. Um, but that's increasingly challenging as home prices are rising and people are moving out, a Latino community, a Latino members are moving further out. Um, one of the real challenges with this is a commitment from the district. So having a commitment, for example, to provide transportation to children who live far enough away from school that they can't walk to school or that their parents can't drop them off. But if they don't live in the area of the school, then there's no transportation option at this point. And so it's really hard to maintain that 50% balance, which is an important piece of dual language education because the idea is that children can support each other in their learning. Right, so kids who speak English are the experts for half the day and kids who speak Spanish are the experts for half the day. Um, if you don't have that balance, it gets, you know, the reality is we live in, an, in a hegemonic society in terms of the dominance of English. English has a lot more um, credibility, a lot more value. And so kids pick up on that very early. And if they feel like their Spanish isn't valued or there are a lot more English speakers, then they're less does that, you know, they don't want to speak Spanish, they don't want to continue their Spanish. I mean, this was, I, you know, my parents both um, grew up speaking Spanish and learned English when they went to school. They grew up in New Mexico um, and they were already English dominant by the time they met. And so my brother and I didn't grow up speaking Spanish. Um, and we didn't want to, to be honest. I, I mean, I, I didn't see the point when I was eight or nine or 10 years old. And now looking back, I realized that was such a missed opportunity. 
for um, for me. And that's part of the reason I'm so passionate about this work is because I was in that situation and my parents were told by teachers, you know, speak English because they need to know English. They live in the United States. Um, so I don't fault them for that at all. It's it's challenging to raise bilingual kids in in the United States. And in particular in a community like Eugene where you know, they're, they're in the minority. So that's why those programs are so important. Can you say a little bit about how the coronavirus pandemic is impacting this set of problems, this set of issues that you've just been talking about? I mean, how are you, how are they even conducting these programs now? Yeah, um, well, it changes <laughs> on a fairly regular basis. Um, and I think, you know, right now for teachers and schools, it's such a challenge to figure out how to serve kids equitably. Um, I know that there have been plans put forth to bring some children into school, the most vulnerable populations, so children with special needs, children who are ESL learners, um, very early learners, kindergarten and first graders. But as of right now, that hasn't happened. It has happened in some districts. It hasn't happened in Eugene. And um, maybe you saw in Springfield, they started to bring kids back. And then um, I think there are a number of challenges for families right now. One of them, no doubt, is childcare because parents have to work, especially essential workers. Um, even parents who are working at home have challenges in working with their children, um, doing virtual schooling. Technology is a huge challenge, access to internet, um, giving kids opportunities to have the regular supports that they would have. So ESL classes, for instance, is really challenging with schedules, it's challenging with technology, it's challenging with, um, you know, the reality is I, I've been in teacher education now for 10 years. I've never taught virtually until last summer, this summer. So I am also not an expert in how to teach virtually, especially how to teach kids virtually. So this is something we're all grappling with is, okay, how do we prepare our students to do this work given that we've never done this work? Um, and how do we work with teachers to do this work when they're struggling so much to figure out how do I engage six and seven year olds across a computer screen? How do I assess children's writing? So this is something I've been thinking a lot about because you know, kindergarten, first, second grade are such pivotal years for writing. And how do we instruct and assess children's writing virtually. Um, you know, there are apps where kids can write a journal entry, for instance, take a photo, send it to their teacher, and then the teacher can give some feedback. But it's not the same as sitting next to a child and asking them, okay, you know, get us a seal. What do you want to say in this story? Or, um, you know, what is it that you, okay, you're having trouble writing that word. Well, let's sound it out, right? It's just a very different um, context that I think we're all trying to figure out what are the best tools? How do we not overwhelm children and families? Um, I really appreciated that this uh, state superintendent, Colt Gill, in one of the calls this summer said to you know teachers and stakeholders, the number one priority for the first few weeks of school is to build community and let kids know that we care about them and that we're concerned about their families and that we understand that these are challenging times for everybody. So I think that, um, you know, unfortunately, the academic losses are going to be, um, they're, they're going to be around for a while. I think about those kids who are not getting meaningful language and literacy instruction in the same way they would in schools. And um, I'm concerned about that. Lots of, lots of us are concerned about that. So at this point, I want to pivot a little in, in our discussion. I want to talk about the new uh, Latinx studies uh, program at U of O. So first, um, why is it important to have a Latinx studies program at the U of O? Why is that something that the university needs to do? Well, I think there are a couple of main reasons. Um, I guess one of the least compelling but most um, realistic reasons is the demographic imperative, right? The population of Oregon is changing. Uh, the, the percent of undergraduates who identify as Latino, Latina, or Latinx has increased 10% in the last 10 years. So it's now almost 14% of the undergraduate population. 
Um, those students have been very drawn to the minor. So I've already met, um, I'm advising students right now in the minor and I've met uh, with our 10 students who have the minor. Um, and the enthusiasm that they've shown for this has been really uh, impressive. So I've met with a couple of students who are juniors and seniors now who say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad that there's a minor. There wasn't when I started, but you know, if I had known, I'm mean, telling my friends. And so I think there's a real interest in this. We have a very activist and engaged undergraduate population. So, um, you know, if you take a look at the Latinx Studies website, you'll see we have Mecha, Mujeres, uh, the Latinx Male and Allies Alliance, the, the undergraduates organize a conference every year for Latinx high school students, Raices Unidas. And um, I went, it was in February, just before <laughs> we were forced to leave campus. And there were hundreds of uh, Latinx identifying high schoolers from all over the state who came to this conference to meet with undergraduates, to hear from faculty and doctoral students. And so I think one of the reasons is because there's a real need for this. You know, students are interested in learning about their backgrounds. They're interested in learning more about the Latinx history of the United States or of the United States and of Oregon. Um, so I think that's a big reason. The other reason is because I think there are issues related to race, ethnicity, language, and identity that all of us need to grapple with, especially right now, 15 days from the election, that uh, we can't keep business as usual. You know, I think the wider university community needs to understand the experiences and perspectives of Latinx communities, why that's important historically and in contemporary society. And one of the real goals that I have is uh, for people to understand the diversity of these experiences, right? So just for example, my family's been in the United States for 500 years, right? My, my ancestors are, from what is now New Mexico, but what was you you know Mexico, and before that um, indigenous land, since at least probably the 1500s. But that's a, a pretty unique experience relative to the generations of immigrants who've come since then, and so that's a very different experience than a first generation um, Mexican or Ecuadorian or Salvadoran. Um, and we have an increasing population of Guatemalan students in Oregon. Um, so just understanding that it's not a monolith, right? The other important piece is that it's not a racial identification. So Latinx people can be black, they can be white, they can be, um, you know, from any number of um, races. And so I think that's what's exciting to me is the, the way the program is designed is interdisciplinary. So we currently have 42 courses that students can choose from. Uh, that's in, I think, nine departments and four colleges around campus. So that's 42 faculty who conduct research and teach courses in Latinx studies all, all over campus, everything from women's and gender studies, from history, anthropology, sociology, education. So it's really an opportunity for our community to learn more about the experiences and perspectives of Latinx people. So how will the Latinx studies program support the Latinx scholars residential community? You mentioned it in passing earlier in our talk. Yeah, so we have a residential community that's in its second year, the Latinx scholars arc. That's for first year and freshman students who are interested in Latinx issues. They don't have to identify as Latinx, although the vast majority of them do. Um, and the way that they're, uh, they're actually designed to work together. So students in the ARC take a seminar together every quarter that with the faculty director, and I'm one of the directors along with uh, Juan Eduardo Wolf from music and uh, from School of Music and Dance, and then with um, Kelly Leon Howarth from Romance Languages. So they take the seminar, which is a one credit quarterly, and then they also have to take another course in um, ethnic studies, one in history, and one in um, romance languages. And those count toward the minor. So it's sort of a fast track, if you will, that four of the courses that our Latinx scholars take count toward the minor, which is 24 credits. So, um, so they're designed to work together. We, um, 
as part of the ARC, we reserve seats in other courses for our students. So for instance, uh, linguistics course, that's an introduction, introduction to bilingualism, which will be offered next quarter. They're going to reserve five seats for ARC students who are interested in taking that course. So we really try to work together so that they can experience a wide variety of options that can count toward the minor. Um, and many of the same people, and my colleagues, Michael Hames Garcia, who is really the driving force behind this program, was also the, the um, inaugural faculty director of the Latinx Scholars Arc. So it's, it's a lot of uh, things coming together, which is what I think is really cool because like you mentioned earlier, the Center for Latino and Latin American Studies has been a huge support for this work. Um, the Latinx Strategies Group really was instrumental in starting the ARC. Uh, there's a program called Tarea Time, which is, uh, means homework time for Latinx students that is you know, two hours a week where they can come together virtually now and do homework, ask questions, meet with career advisors, meet with faculty directors. Um, so really it's, it's a bunch of things that have come together and, um, and it's been years of work on the part of stakeholders and students who have been instrumental in bringing this program to campus. So you've already uh, given us a sense, I think, of, of how the, the uh, program will help to retain Latinx students. And I know that retention is, is an issue with students of color and it's an issue of students. Uh, but will you tell us a little bit about some of the efforts that are being undertaken to boost the hiring of Latinx faculty? Yeah, this is a really important question and one that we're very concerned about. Um, so the stakeholders group, we have a smaller group as well. That's the visioning committee, which is faculty and students. And we have set as one of our priorities for the first three years of the program, which is my sort of tenureship as, as director, to recruit and retain particularly senior faculty in Latinx studies. So we're very interested in the provost's announcement last week about the new center that they're creating um, on um, racial disparities and resilience. I think this is the perfect opportunity for us to really advocate for hires in Latinx studies. That is, we want to draw scholars from around the country to U of O to continue to expand our really, you know, we have 42 at least faculty who do this kind of work. Um, one of the areas that we're very interested in recruiting for is um, someone who studied Afro-Latinidad. So the intersection between um, African-American experience and Latinx experience. I've been talking with my colleague, Avinash Tabari, who's the director of Black Studies, um, on how we might work together to propose faculty hires, or because I think that's something we've heard from students that is underrepresented currently in our program is, um, and there are people who do amazing work in Afro Latinidad studies. So we're, we're really thinking about um, sort of advocating with the provost's office, advocating with the president's office around these very important hires to, you know, to, to build that capacity. One of the other challenges that U of O has had for a long time is the retention of faculty of color. Mm -hmm. Can you, do you have a sense of how this program might help in that effort? Ah, well, I, I'm not sure exactly what, <laughs> what they have planned, but one thing I will say is that I think it's really important to have the support and feedback of the strong Latinx community that's already here. Um, in the sense of, I hope that there's collaboration when the administration is making these decisions between the, you know, the hiring, the center developers, whoever that may be, and for instance, the Latinx Strategies Group and the Latinx Vision Committee, because this is what we're thinking about all the time. And, um, and I think that community is a huge support, just like it is for students, having a Latinx Studies minor, having an ARC, having these student groups builds community for students. The same is true for faculty. When I started here, uh, I got involved with class pretty early, and that was a big support for me, both in terms of colleagues and in terms of programming and in terms of um, some financial support even. And um, I think 
if people come to campus and they don't feel welcome or they don't feel like there's a place for them, they're not going to stay. So that's one of the things that I hope that this new program will establish is some just build a foundation so that when people come in, they say, oh, wow, look at all these people doing this kind of work. How can I get connected to that? Um, and so I, I think that that is absolutely important. Um, you know, and especially in a university, like many universities, where faculty of color are a small minority, a very small minority. Um, so, so yeah, I think that I'm hoping we can collaborate with the administration around these issues to retain high quality faculty. So you're also a member of the working groups, uh, the Dreamers Working Group Steering Committee. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about the particular challenges that are confronting undocumented college students right now? Sure. Um, you know, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of um, contention around DACA. And there's been, uh, you know, the presidential mandates that have been since overturned by the Supreme Court. Um, so DACA is safe for now, but it's still an executive order, right? It's not a law. And so there's ongoing uncertainty for students from undocumented backgrounds. Um, and actually, interestingly, Oregon has a high percentage of DACA recipients relative to other states of a similar population. So, um, so we have a lot of students on our campus who are affected by um, documenting documentation status and issues, if not themselves, then within their families. Um, so I think that anxiety and uncertainty is one of the big challenges. We've really tried to work uh, on that. We have a new student specialist, well, he's not new, but we have a student specialist at the Counseling Center, um, Eric Garcia, who runs a group for Dreamers. And sorry, they're mowing the lawn. Um, so there are certainly mental health issues. There are issues around uncertainty because they don't necessarily know what's going to happen in the next year with DACA. Uh, we do have uh, access to an immigration attorney for DACA students on campus that we can connect them to, to get some legal support. Um, being able to know whether they're gonna be able to finish their degrees in a timely manner is a challenge for DACA students right now. So all of the things you might imagine being difficult for underrepresented students are even more challenging for documented or undocumented students right now. So we're, we're almost out of time. This will be my last question. Tell us about one of the courses that you teach. Sure. Um, one of the courses I teach is an undergraduate course called the Foundations of Literacy. And um, it is a theory course to introduce students to this concept of literacy and literacies. So what does it mean to be literate and who decides and how do we measure that? Um, also, we talk a lot about issues of power around literacy, so who controls the message, who gets to write and who gets to read. And so we sort of take a historical and a contemporary approach to this in terms of thinking about how people engage with the written word. Um, and as I said, I'm particularly interested in bilingualism and I'm particularly interested in how children engage with text uh, in different ways. So we talk a lot about, um, this is a large class, it's about 90 students, it's all of our seniors. So we talk a lot about their experiences with literacy, their relationship with literacy, um, and how they think about literacy in times that are quite different than when I was an undergraduate, right? In terms of reading online, reading on your phone, reading on a Kindle, um, social media is a big area of literacy. So we talk a lot about, okay, what constitutes literacy? Is a Twitter post an, an instance of literacy? Well, sure, it's an act of literacy, right? Um, and we talk a lot about how we enact our identities through literacy. So, I mean, you can see behind me, I've got, you know, posters that, that are written. That's an act of literacy that engages my identity. So when people come into my office and they see that, they think, okay, I understand something about her. Um, so just kind of attempting to broaden their definitions of what constitutes reading and writing, what constitutes languaging, 
how do we use those to move through the world, right? When we wear a shirt that has Nike on it, that makes a statement, right? That's an act of literacy. And so I really want them to go into, and many of the students in that undergraduate course go into our master's in teaching program, where they learn then the practical, how do you teach kids to read and write, um, to really help them appreciate and understand the literacies that our students bring with them. Because the kids in our classes, just like the students in my classes, are all experts in something, right? And maybe it's something I don't know anything about. So um, how can a student, for instance, teach me the literacy of Taekwondo? What does it mean to be literate in Taekwondo? How did you become literate in Taekwondo? How can you help others become literate in Taekwondo? So it's really, um, I, I actually really love teaching that course because it's a very broad theoretical course to get students to just think about things a little bit differently than they've ever thought about them before. Um, and, you know, I hope that they do uh, leave with a broader sense of just appreciating the, the knowledge and skills and experience that even five-year-olds bring into the classroom, right? That's kind of my planting the seed <laughs> as they go into, uh, into teaching or into social services to help them support our students in becoming lifelong learners. Well, thanks. That's a great uh, note on which to end. Uh, thanks, Audrey, so much for speaking with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Paul. I've been speaking with Audrey Lucero, Associate Professor of Education Studies and Director of Critical and Sociocultural Studies in Education at the University of Oregon and Director of the newly launched Latinx Studies Minor. Thanks so much for watching.